Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar on the future of sustainable agrochemistry. My name is Ellen Mantis, and I'm the director of the Chemical Sciences Roundtable at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. For those not familiar with the Roundtable, it provides a neutral forum to advance the understanding of issues of importance to the chemical sciences and engineering, and promotes the exchange of information among government, industry, and academic sectors. This year, we are excited to have launched a series of webinars on emerging topics. This is the fourth and final one in our series for 2020. Presentations and recordings from our first webinar on inorganic biohybrids, our second webinar on the detection of novel synthetic opioids, and our third webinar on the chemical supply chain are all available on the CSR website. Today, we will examine the current landscape of agrochemistry and discuss methods and technologies to sustain crop production into the future using chemistry. The format will consist of three short presentations. There will be time for one or two clarifying questions after each presentation, but all other questions will be addressed in our discussion time after the presentations conclude. Dr. Mark Jones will be our moderator for this webinar. He is a member of the CSR and is a senior research fellow at Dow, where he serves on the research and development leadership team. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A button on Zoom, located at the bottom control panel. Just for your information, the chat feature has been disabled for audience members. For those tuning in via live stream on the CSR website, please submit questions by email to csr at nas.edu. With that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Peter X. Dr. X is the president of BASF Bioscience Research. He leads his company's Global Competence Center for Life Sciences, where he drives innovative, sustainable solutions for agricultural, food, and industrial applications for a better life and an improved environment. The floor is yours, Dr. X. All right. I think now you could probably hear me. Um, yeah, it was a great opportunity um, to talk here. Um, and I think when I was asked to participate in this uh, webinar, this was actually not a, that was not a difficult decision for me. Um, I've been uh, in the agricultural segment for the past two decades, uh, and I'm very happy to share some of the insights that I've gained over the years to explain um, also how the farming community and farming has changed over the years, um, how the demands have changed and how science really has then responded um, to make all these change possible. Um, but let me start first, uh, let me start first, move to the next slide, please. Okay, yeah, good, thank you. But uh, as BSF is not a, a household name, um, I just wanted to start with a couple of information facts on BSF, the company that I'm worked uh, with uh, for many years. So BSF is first of all, 120,000 people. Um, and I think notably every tenth of us is actually working in R&D. Um, with uh, 70 billion in sales, we are by far the largest company and we have a very diverse portfolio. Now, one of the important uh, segments that we are addressing with our portfolio is the agricultural sector. Um, and our agricultural solution business is with 9 billion, a very important contributor to BSF's success. Now, um, BSF is very innovation minded. So we spent 2.6 billion in R&D. And as you can see here also on this slide is our agricultural solution segment is by far the segment that is, um, has the highest R&D intensity. Um, and I think this also speaks uh, how really innovation driven the agricultural um, segment, uh, how, uh, how innovation driven the agricultural segment is. If you could please move to the next slide. Yeah, um, I myself have not raised and, and been born and uh, started in agriculture. I'm a chemist really by training and I actually started out and thought I would be a professor um, in one year. I decided then differently and joined BSF uh, 30 years ago. Um, and I have to say, I'm more excited than ever to really work in the chemical industry and um, at BSF. And there's a pretty simple reason for this because I think when I think of today about chemistry, I think about 
that we are critical to solve some of the most important problems. Um, as you can see here of the slides, I think we're expecting by 2050, 10 billion people on this planet. Um, there will be a significant part of these uh, um, people will live in urban megacities. Um, there's a significant uptake of 35% in energy expected and also 30% of food. And all these challenges um, from a chemist perspective, I think are opportunities. And this is where um, I am excited to work in chemistry because chemistry is a key enabler um, for this sector. If you could please move to the next slide. Now, from my viewpoint, the chemistry has really changed and sustainability is a key factor. And I think this is fully reflected in the um, purpose that we have defined as BSF. We create chemistry for a sustainable future. Now, the word of sustainability is used a lot these days and sometimes it's abused. And we wanted to make sure as BSF that really this is not lip service. And therefore we have um, really hardwired the topic of sustainable chemistry um, um, to our strategy. So we are um, working hard to develop new processes that decouple CO2 emission um, from our organic growth. We are also looking and investing in breakthrough technologies that enable um, a more circular economy. And then last but not least, really looking for innovations that drive and that are of um, sustainable advantage to our value chains. Now, the question is when you say we um, create chemistry of a sustainable future. The question is, who is we? And let's move to the next slide, please. Now, innovation um, you know, is really done by people. And I think this is something I, I absolutely want to highlight. So it's about um, getting these people, um, getting engaged um, into a sustainable solution. And for us, it means that we need really the brightest mind um, in, uh, on board at BSF. So um, these minds then need to understand what really society and our customer needs. And I think then we can translate all of that into um, in a, a new innovative uh, um, solution. And this is, I think, um, where I, my excitement comes in um, and also why I believe that it's really rewarding to be um, in this field. And I think this is exactly also when we think about agriculture now, um, where we, our teams in agricultural solution, they're looking to really create these sustainable um, solution um, and really uh, do this for what I would consider the biggest job on earth, which is farming. If you please move to the next slide. Now, indeed, um, farming, from my viewpoint, is the biggest job on earth. And I think in recent years, and this is also important to put this in context, um, it actually, it is this, this, this big job is getting bigger. Um, farmers are today really faced with a lot of challenges. There are multiple demands coming in their direction. Um, they are tasked to really create, create a sufficient, affordable, and healthy food um, for a growing population. I think this is the basics. But then there's much more because there's not just the food topic. Is they have to deal with climate change. Um, they have also to deal with all the challenges from society to have more sustainable agricultural practice, despite the fact that farmers really for, often for generation have been stewards of their land and they are facing a market volatility. So I think this is all um, needs to put in the equation when we talk about sustainable agrochemicals um, and agrochemistry. And I think today it's really not easy to be a farmer. Nonetheless, these people are incredible passionate about what they do and they simply love farming. Now the question is for us, and this is really the topic of also today's uh, webinar is how can we actually help farmers? How can we make uh, um, and help them to respond to these challenges? And at BSF, our mission is at the end to make farmers more successful to and provide them with sustainable innovations and in crop protection in also seeds and trades, um, digital farming. And I think we really need to make sure that the sustainability, as I said, is um, directly hardwired. And at BSF, we have developed a system, a robust framework, which we call sustainable solution steering. And I think this is critical because this is sort of the compass that guides also our R&D. And I would just want to introduce this compass with the next slide. Now, we have uh, basically taken measurable criteria and categorized our portfolio um, in four categories. Um, number one, most important 
are accelerators. These are, these are products that really contribute directly to the sustainability of our customers. Then we have performers that are fully um, in line with the sustain, sustain, sustainability expectation. Then there are performers, and these are products that do have deficiency in sustainability, and we address them. And lastly, there are challenges, and these are the products that we want to um, really phase out of our, um, of our portfolio. Now, to drive now our portfolio actively, we have set ourselves ambitious goal, and you see that on the right side of the slide. Now, most importantly for R&D, we have directly um, um, used this concept for our R&D portfolio and also for our R&D approaches. And I think this leads directly now in the, co in the topic, how actually has this changed the way we are doing agrochemistry? And please move to the next slide with that. Now, if you look historically, um, agrochemistry were developed um, and discovered in a, I would say, very sequential linear approach. Um, you would first discover some chemistry, you would opt optimize the biology, and then later on, you would um, also do regulatory tests. But I think the mindset, the, the, the philosophy was you would first look really at field performance, and then you would take the hurdles later on um, on the regular piece. I think this, from my viewpoint, has totally changed. And as you see on the upper left side, I think this, sir, this is a very different approach today. And what has changed with the approach that you really do develop these things in parallel. So we start with a comprehensive product profile first. And then this comprehensive product profile that includes regulatory aspect as well as performance aspect. These are used then to define our R&D approaches that we take with an individual program. And I think this way we are um, sieving out much earlier um, uh, chemistries that are not attractive and change them um, and uh, um, can uh, focus really on products that are inherently have a sustainable approach. And we use very extensively here a regulatory indicator test in toxicology and environment. And you see here on this slide, um, uh, you, you see Robert Lanziel, and he's one of the passionate scientists that expands our portfolio of these indicator tests so that we can early on really sieve out um, uh, candidates that do not fit with regulatory requirements and make sure that we use these tests um, as we go along in this parallel approach. And we feel that these early indicator tests are real differentiator for us. Now let's move to the second topic and move to um, um, uh, a second trend I think we see in agrochemicals. And um, let's move to the middle of the slide here. Now, um, what we experience in nature is that nature involves them. And therefore we see um, to pests, to fungal pathogens and weeds that they really um, form resistance to existing products um, in the marketplace. And this will even happen without excessive use, but it's just a part of the natural progression of biological system that they adapt to um, any kind of selection pressure. And this is uh, something that we need to help farmers really to manage. Now, therefore we focus on our approaches in agrochemicals to new biological mode of actions that have favorable regulatory um, profiles. And in Scalis that's shown here is one of these chemistry it is a natural product. It's produced by fermentation and then derivatized. And the derivatization brings it a broader spectrum, um, lower use rate, and therefore also make it um, a much more attractive uh, product for farmers. Now the molecular target of Inscalis, and this is critical here, or as we say, the insecticidal mode of action was elucidated by a very strong team, which includes uh, Vin Salgado. And um, the elucidation actually was uh, uh, awarded uh, was an award of the American Chemical Society. And this unique chemistry of Inscalis, I think what is special with the mode of action is that um, the mode of action does not, is not present in mammals or in birds or, um, or in fish. And therefore it's intrinsically favorable from an, of an, of an environmental profile. So this is the second um, topic. Now the third trend that we see, and I think this is an important one is digitalization. And I would say nothing has changed as much really the way we do research these days than digitalization. And I want to use uh, our blockbuster uh, Revisol as an example. Now Revisol is a azole fungicide. It's a well-known class that 
inhibits the fungal uh, sterol biosynthesis. Now, this chemistry also has unwanted effect. And I think the key topic here was to uncouple the unwanted effect from the performance. And this is where exactly digitalization has kicked in. Now, in case of uh, uh, um, Revisol, we have really used all the tools. So we used molecular modeling, the indicator test that I just uh, mentioned. Um, we, we also uh, used uh, uh, the uh, machine learning tools. And all of that brings together to solve the riddle to uncouple here these effects. Now, the molecular modeling helped with the target uh, uh, performance. The tox test weeded out unwanted uh, compounds. And then with the um, high throughput screening and machine learning, we have refined our models. And basically, this led then to Revisol. And I think this is a huge interdisciplinary um, a piece. And I would say for most people actually working in this field, this is also part of the fun that it's so interdisciplinary. And it's absolutely required to develop these sustainable solutions. Now, um, from that standpoint, I think I've described a little bit what changes we have seen in agrochemistry. Now, um, the deeper understanding really of the molecular biology has been key here, molecular modeling tools and digitalization. But I think there's another dimension that comes with integrated solution. And in the next slide, if you could forward, please, um, I want to talk about the integrated solutions that we see. And then this deeper understanding really of um, the molecular um, um, of the molecular level of crop lands has also helped to develop an interplay between agrochemistry and traits. Um, this I want to demonstrate with a, um, with a, a chemistry that we have developed, um, which is a herbicide, the so-called PPO herbicides, which inhibit the protoporphyrogen oxidase. And these herbicides, they are well known. Um, and we understand a lot about the molecular target these days. And this understanding actually has now enabled not only to optimize the chemistry, but also design traits that work with the chemistry. And I think this, um, this uh, allowed us to make specific changes then to the amino acid sequence of the target protein and basically make the target protein in the plant then resistant to these herbicides. And you see that very nicely here on the picture that you can broaden the spectrum of herbicides, make them more selective and more broadly applicable. And I think this has direct interaction also then um, um, for the farmer. Why has it direct interaction for the farmer? Because yes, there might be very different perspectives in society about herbicides and herbicide traits. Um, and, but at the end, one has to say, there is a clear um, contribution to sustainability. Now, weeds do compete with plants um, about water and nutrition. Um, and therefore, it's very important for farmers that they can manage these difficult to control wheat because it directly translates into increased yield and better land use. But there's a, another dimension um, actually of these kind of um, solutions um, that we offer because it also allows no-till no no farming practices and that actually reduces uh, land erosion and also increase the capture of CO2 in the soil. So I think there are multiple benefits that hopefully I could convince you with these kind of technologies. Now, these kind of solutions, they are just one example. I think there are new ones coming, um, be it combination of insecticides and insect traits or fungicides and fungal traits, um, or the combination of chemistry and biology and biologicals as we have it like in our Votivo product, or we also learn from nature and use um, things like pheromones to confuse pests and reduce their reproduction. So I would say really the advancement signs at the end are leading to uh, an increase in the option space for farmers. So there are additional possibilities. And I think these additional possibilities are of benefit to the farming community and for production. And there's one last topic I wanted to cover, and this is another one coming to digitalization and how digitalization is changing farmer, farming. And let us move please with that to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about our Xavio platform. And um, with our Xavio scouting digital platform, we are actually offer these days growers the possibility to monitor in-season disease, um, to look at pests and scout for weeds and also look for leaf damages. Now, this information then helps the farmers to make decisions, to think about what agrochemicals to use, also to optimize the timing. Now, in addition, we develop 
um, together jointly with uh, Bosch, our partner, and we actually announced today uh, that we have started a joint venture here, um, um, that we are developing sp smart sprayers so that they are specifically in the right places um, um, uh, applying the products that we bring to the market. And we are right now testing prototypes and will go to the market as early as next year. Now with the Xavio Healthy uh, Field Platform, we are coming to a different dimension. It's not just about offering decision. Um, 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 it's not just about helping and giving advice to farmers. It's really about decision-making. So here we offer to farmers an outcome, a disease field free, a, a disease free field. And that means um, that we actually help farmers directly to manage the field and get an outcome. And obviously here, there's a big interest also on our side to reduce the um, chemicals input that we um, use then for these uh, farming situations. Now, this is a great uh, new tool and it had rightfully be awarded with a Crop Science Award in 2020 as the best uh, innovation in digital farming. Now, as you can see, um, the farming with all these options is getting more complex, um, but I think um, uh, we want SPSF to really provide farmers a comprehensive view. We want to provide them decision with the seed, with the trade, with the agrochemicals, and also with digital tools all along. Now, if you move, please, to my last slide. Now, from my perspective, I would say um, science is really, and new technologies are offering um, farmers new possibilities. Um, I think there are additional options. Sometimes they might be perceived as complicated and difficult. And often the society is asking for um, simple solutions. But um, if you look at the challenges that actually farming is facing today, in a lot of cases, there are no simple solutions. And it's not a question of an either or decision. It's from my viewpoint, really an end, end, end decision. It's about helping farmers um, to make the right among the many available uh, uh, um, options that they have. And from my perspective, really, um, growers and also the society benefits from all these options. And um, I believe that it helps them to balance risk. It helps to, at the end, optimize the inputs for better yield, um, to create economic success, and very importantly also, environmental sustainability. Now, as a business, BSF is developing these agrochemicals together with seeds, trades, digital solution to exactly provide this balance. And we see it as our task to bring to farmers innovation and help them to make the right choices, um, balancing the demand of society, um, catering also to all the needs of the value chain and maintain their own livelihood and profitability. Now, uh, from my viewpoint, as I said, you know, the biggest job on earth is getting bigger. But I personally see that actually innovation is driving and enabling sustainable solution. And um, I think there are many reasons to be optimistic um, when I think at least about the future. Thank you very much. And uh, on the last slide, just a reminder, we have, will have a discussion later on, but I'm very happy if you want to connect with you. And with this, I turn it back. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, Peter. A very interesting talk. And we do have, a, I think, a couple of uh, questions that kind of hit on one particular aspect of your BASF look at the world. And, and that is around how you use life cycle analysis to, um, to figure out your trade-off. So obviously you create a burden when you manufacture uh, any chemical. How do you then balance that with the various uh, environmental metrics that people would care about in a, you know, energy use, CO2 emissions, um, water use, eutrophication, any of the other things? How do, you, how do you try to figure out where that balance is in an LCA world? I think you've muted yourself again too, or you've been muted. <laughs> yeah, I think this, is, this, this balance is a tricky topic. So the uh, sus sustainable solution steering. I think these criteria help us really to create transparency. Um, and I think this trans transparency piece is a very important piece. So this is what we, I think, bring also into society and then into the discussion with stakeholder. So it's not just about us making at the end decision, but for us, I think, making transparency. Um, and I think then also 
um, um, farmers, they have to decide based on the transparency uh, that we create. And um, um, indeed, there is, as I said, this is not a simple um, uh, equation that has a clear outcome, but I would say the transparency piece is what is very important. Oh, well, very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, George Friswald is a professor of agriculture and resource economics at the University of Arizona. George received his undergraduate and doctoral degrees from the University of California, Berkeley. He held teaching and research positions at the Johns Hopkins University, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and India's National Institute of Rural Development. In the 1995-96 uh, timeframe, uh, Dr. Priswald served as senior ec economist for the President's Council of Economic Advisors. His research interests include the economics of agricultural biotechnology, pesticide use, and pesticide regulation publishing extensively on management of weed and insect pest resistance. He is currently an associate editor for the journal Pest Management Science. And without further ado, floor is yours, George. Thank you very much. Am I unmuted? Yes, I'm unmuted. Let's see, I am, can I advance? Yes. Okay, to give you some historical background, um, a lot of colleagues in land-grant universities of a certain age with farm backgrounds, and they all have not so nostalgic stories of going out and hand weeding when they were kids in their grandparents' fields. Or their, um, and you could see from this graph, this is showing the, kind of the, the diffusion of herbicides in major US crops um, since 1952. In the immediate post-World War II era, herbicides really weren't used all that much. Um, and hand weeding was how weeds were controlled. And you could see that from 1952 to about 1982, in 30 years, um, herbicides as a, the method of controlling weeds became ubiquitous, um, especially in, in cotton, corn, and soybean systems. Um, and um, you could see the ramp up from 1964 of, of herbicide use. You see a tick down in 19, should be about the slides got off kilter, 1983 when they had a, the pick program which took huge amounts of crop acreage out of production. You could see about 1996 when herbicide tolerant uh, crop varieties, specifically glyphosate um, tolerant varieties became available and glyphosate started to substitute for the older chemistries. And there was a downtick in um, herbicide use. And then in terms of pounds of AI active ingredient, it started to ramp up more recently. So the introduction of herbicide tolerant uh, crop varieties um, raised two sorts of sustainab sustainability issues. One was that the body of evidence, body of research suggests that herbicide tolerant crops um, actually promoted the adoption of conservation tillage. Conservation tillage uses, um, allows more residues to stay on, on the soil and reduces soil erosion. So soil erosion has longer term sustainability effects in terms of reducing uh, the productivity of soils, but also there's uh, more immediate term environmental consequences of having sediment running off um, farm fields and into water bodies. So the, the, the switch to herbicide tolerant cultivars um, really promoted uh, the adoption and the movement toward conservation tillage and no-till. So that's on the sustainability plus side, an area of concern was, has been the evolution of herbicide resistance in weed species, um, especially as um, um, there was um, less diversity in the types of chemicals that were being used. And here's some just literature view of the complementarity of herbicide tolerant seed varieties with conservation tillage for your background information. Okay, so with the uh, rapid and pervasive adoption of, of glyphosate use, um, you could see um, that um, 
the number of glyphosate resistant weeds um, worldwide started to ramp up pretty dramatically uh, since the mid 90s when uh, glyphosate resistant crop varieties became available. Now herbicide resistance isn't all a story of glyphosate resistance. Um, this is data from the, the site that Dr. Ian Heat maintains for the Weed Science Society of America. You can see that there's weed species with resistance to more than one site of action has also been ramping up over time. So weeds are evolving resistance to um, all different modes of action. Now, where this becomes a sustainability issue, here's a, a chart of the introduction time of new herbicide sites of action. And you could see there was you know, a fairly steady increase over time, and that's really stopped uh, since 1990. So over the past 30 years, we haven't really had um, you know, a big a breakthrough in, in sites of action uh, that have been commercialized and widely adopted. Uh, companies are always uh, conducting R&D. They're always trying to develop new modes of action. But um, the, the chemicals, the compounds we have now are, are the resources that, that we have to, to use. And over time, crop output per unit of quality adjusted input has been declining. So there starts, there starts to be evidence now that um, resistance issues are starting to manifest themselves in measures of, of agricultural productivity in the US. Okay, so economists have long thought of uh, the efficacy of agricultural chemicals as an exhaustible resource. Um, certain compounds, certain sites of action are effective but through repeated use over time, they become less so. So um, a way this has been characterized is something almost like, um, you know, minerals in the ground or petroleum reserves, where there's a cycle of depletion and discovery. Just like there's petroleum or mineral reserves that in a particular site, particular location get depleted, there's always searching, there's always discovering. And so the extent to which um, the efficacy of chemicals is that truly exhaustible depends on whether discoveries are forthcoming. And over the last three decades, um, commercial discoveries have not been forthcoming. Another um, economic issue dealing with resistance is that resistance is a common pool resource management problem, or at least it can be. The idea here being that um, uh, for, for an individual farmer, a challenger and a question they pose is why should I take steps to delay re resistance, often steps that might reduce my farm income in the short run, um, if my, all my neighbors are going to use the compounds and resistance is going to happen anyway. And so a question for farmers intertemporally is, okay, what can I personally do to actually delay resistance? And will my actions actually be for naught if my neighbors don't? So then it starts to become a collective action problem, not necessarily a long-term profit maximizing issue for farmers. Resistance management could also be seen as what economists call the weakest link public good. A weakest link public good is uh, a good that, its provision depends on the effort and the effectiveness of the least capable uh, actor or the person with the least incentive. The classic example would be, let's say an island nation that's divided up into different communities and each community is responsible for building a seawall to keep out floods. Well, the effectiveness on the small island nation of the seawall is going to depend on which community builds the lowest wall. If, if everybody in the community except one, you know, one group builds seawalls and one group doesn't build a seawall, then the water is just going to flood in. And so resistance management has certain aspects of that where you could have uh, a lot of farmers doing 
um, what's needed in terms of uh, resistance management, but there's a critical mass of farmers who don't do that, which is enough to undermine overall resistance management efforts. Okay, so if we look at actual farmer adoption of resistance management practices in, in dealing with, with weeds and dealing with insect pests, the most difficult species to manage is Homo sapiens. So getting actual you know, human beings to uh, change their behavior is always tricky. Now, good news, looking at studies of um, farmer adoption of resistance management practices is that most farmers are adopting most practices that experts think are needed to delay resistance most of the time. Well, that can sound good, but if you were told that most of the people packing parachutes were adopting most of the recommended practices for packing parachutes most of the time, you might be a little hesitant about going skydiving. And empirically, we found that most farmers doing most things most of the time has been insufficient to delay resistance in many cases. Now, a key you know, biological and economic question are what are critical adoption thresholds? How, what percentage of farmers, what percentage of the landscape needs to be adopting resistance management practices uh, to make them effective? If you only need half the farmers or farmers uh, managing half the acreage to adopt resistance management practices for it to be effective overall, then really resistance management is a traditional extension problem of providing, let's say, the more progressive or, or you know, forward-thinking farmers with the information and they'll adopt the practices and that will uh, benefit everybody. But what if you need, let's say, 90% of the land area adopting the resistance management practices? What if you need 95% of the area to be adopting those practices? Then resistance management is much more like pest or disease eradication, and then collective action might be more necessary. And so another key economic question and agronomic question is when is private action sufficient? So under what circumstances, if farmers are managing weeds on their own fields, are resistance management strategies effective and profitable regardless of what their, their neighbors do? And in what circumstances would individual farmer action would be undermined by neighbor inaction? So when is private action sufficient? And when is collective action necessary? And it's important to identify both because if you can identify cases where, um, you know, here, here's a program of weed management for, for farmers in a particular area. And if individual farmers do that, they have an economic incentive to do that on their own. Then you don't have these issues of how do you manage uh, collective behavior uh, or organization. But in cases where um, private action is insufficient, then collective action needs to be considered. Okay, so moving forward sustainably, in terms of um, weed management, diversity is key. There's two types of diversity. There's diversity in herbicide strategies. So um, using diverse modes of action, rotating modes of action. So within the use of chemistries, the idea is to avoid over-reliance on any one compound. There's also diversity of tactics overall. So what is the right mix of chemical and non-chemical tactics that work? So there's kind of diversity within chemical use and diversity uh, between using chemical and non-chemical tactics. Um, now there's a lot, I think, of promising technology uh, innovations. Peter talked about this already, about non-chemical information. There's advances in information technology, precision ag, AI, drone, robotics. So what, what does all that technology mean for the chemical industry and the use of chemicals and the role of chemicals in agricultural production? Well, I think there's both substitutable and uh, complementary aspects to it. So um, these new innovations, these new you know, uh, information techs and, and mechanical innovations are gonna 
provide for more precise and uh, effective chemical applications. So the quantities applied, the timing of the applies are gonna get more uh, precise over time. So the actual physical amount of the compound, the number of times a compound is applied may change, but it's still going to be used. It's still gonna be critical for weed control. And these types of innovations are complementary with, with ag chemical use. And again, there's other technologies where you're going to have improved non-chemical control. There's you know, a lot of work being done on, on using robotics and more advanced uh, mechanical means of, of controlling weeds. And so these are cases where um, new, new innovations could actually substitute for chemicals. But I, I think it's, it's not going to be either or. I think innovation in the future is gonna proceed along both complementary and, and substitutability paths. Okay, now, we're starting to see in, in industry a changing business model where, where what is being sold is pest management services versus agricultural chemicals per se. And again, Peter talked about decision making, helping farmers making decisions. And this is the direction um, I think you, know, you see more and more industries, you know, more and more firms in the, in the chemical industry going to, whereas they're, they're providing pest management services there's a whole package where chemicals are part of it, but really the objective is, is having uh, fields free of weeds. One of the things this means is that agricultural chemical use is going to be more information and skill intensive when um, the glyphosate resistant crops first came out. One of the things that was attractive to farmers and when farmers were surveyed about um, you know, why, why, why are you adopting these crops? One of the things they would commonly say is it's easy to use. The timing makes things flexible that they could do certain, they had a certain very simplified application regime that wasn't particularly uh, information intensive. Well, that, that's proving to be somewhat problematic. And I think what's, what we're going back to is a system that is gonna require a lot more information about climate, a lot more information about weather, a lot more information about biological sy systems. So ag chemical use is going to be, uh, become more skill and information intensive. Another uh, thing that's happening in business is there's a lot more um, greater consumer concern, and this is feeding into a food processor attention now in terms of how crops are grown. Um, a lot of food processing companies, a lot of textile manufacturing companies have sustainability offices, sustainability divisions, and they're starting to monitor more closely um, the environmental footprints, the environmental profiles of crop production. And um, one of the things the advances of this information technology is that at one, on one level, it allows farmers to monitor their fields more and monitor the situation of their agricultural uh, operations, but it also allows other folks to monitor farmers more. So, you know, the food processes who purchase the crops, consumers are also going to have more information about how things are grown. And so I think, um, Agricultural chemicals, you know, in the foreseeable future are still going to be uh, a critical part of agricultural production. But I'd close with a medical analogy is that when you're sick, the first thing you do is you don't go to the pharmacist for a prescription. You go to your general practitioner. Now, there's some cases where, um, you know, uh, a pharmaceutical isn't necessary, but in some cases it is. And so you go to the, the medical practitioner, the practitioner isn't selling phar uh, pharmaceuticals for say, the, the general practitioner is, is to provide you, know, you with health. Um, just as I think these companies are gonna be providing pest management services. So the, 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 mo the business model is going to be more like the general practitioner model where the concern is what's my overall health? So you don't necessarily start with a pharmacist, but you, you know, you you often end up there. You know, you go there, and the doctor says, "Here, here's, you know, you have uh, 
an infection, here's antibiotics and everything's are, are cleared up. So um, I would just close by saying that um, I think, you know, the ag chemistry industry is, you know, is, is proceeding along. It's going to be a lot more high information, high skill um, type of sector than it's ever been before. That's it. Thank and you very much, George. Um, I don't, I think you were very clear. I don't see any clarifying questions. It was a very interesting talk. I, I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting uh, stuff during the discussion. And just a reminder to folks to put those questions in the Q&A window. And um, so moving right along, our next speaker is Tejas Shah. Tejas uh, is a discovery research scientist in Corteva AgriScience. He obtained a BA in chemistry and molecular biology and biochemistry from Rutgers University in 2011. At Rutgers, he performed undergraduate research with Professor Daniel Seidel in the area of hydrogen bonding catalysis and kinetic resolution. He went on to complete his doctoral studies in Professor Neil Garg's laboratory at UCLA. His dissertation focused on using heterocyclic arines, arines to, or as synthetic building blocks and the exploration of nickel catalyzed activation of amid CN bonds. In 2016, he joined Discovery uh, Chemistry Group at uh, Dow AgriSciences, which is now Corteva AgriScience. So without further ado, Tejas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. And I just want to say thank you to the Chemical Science Roundtable for the, for the invitation to give a, a talk at this webinar. And um, thank you for my other speakers, also George and Peter. They gave me a great introduction uh, to my talk now today, entitled in, uh, Innovations in Sustainable Agrochemistry. And so before I get into the sustainability part of my talk, I wanted to ask the question, what does farming look like in 2020? And so I think all of us or many of us know, or we think about, um, we think about tractors, um, we think about harvesting, here's a picture of harvesting wheat here. Um, we think about you know, a lot of manual labor around the world. And then Peter all mentioned this as uh, farming is one of the largest employers uh, of, the world, of uh, people in the world. However, farming has changed um, in the last couple decades. And so this look, might look a little odd to you. This is the inside of a tractor, a uh, John Deere tractor. And it looks a little odd because there's a bunch of screens and there's a joystick, like you're in a gaming, uh, like a gaming console. And so which farming has, has definitely changed in, uh, in, in towards the integration of technology, the integration of data, um, as Peter and George have mentioned. And so, um, not, into, not into the near distant future, you'll see drones. Um, I think uh, uh, George mentioned this uh, later in his, in his slides. Um, and like the Amazon model, delivering things, and hopefully we'll see uh, delivering of agrochemicals. And so farming has already changed um, significantly in the last couple of decades. And I, you know, hopefully today I can tell you about some of the things that farming is even gonna do further um, and into the sustainability area. And so, Today, I'd like to touch on uh, a few things, um, and I've kind of categorized uh, four boxes here, discovery, process pro and product development, application technologies, and product stewardship. And so I won't have time to talk about all of these, um, but I'll talk about today discovery and process and product development. But I wanted to show all four of these areas because sustainability is not about the act, it's just about the active ingredient. Sustainability is about all four of these areas of research put together to make a sustainable product. And so just because you have a sustainable AI does not mean your process to actually make the uh, AI is sustainable or the, or the actual application of the AI is sustainable. And lastly, the product stewardship that George mentioned um, is, is sustainable. And so all four of these need to come together to actually have a sustainable product. And so today, I'll, uh, since I'm a discovery uh, synthetic chemist by training, I'll talk to you today about um, the discovery and process and product development. And so um, just to give a flavor of what, what does discovery look like for those people who don't know, um, it's very similar to pharmaceutical development or pharmaceutical research. And so you really start with the three, or three areas of, of active generation or hit generation, natural products, bioactive hypothesis, or competitor inspired. And so um, in, since we're talking about sustainability today, I'll highlight a little bit about the natural product areas we work in at Corteva. Uh, once we get a hit out of these three areas, they go through a cycle of active gen, lead gen, uh, lead op, and a stage molecule. You can think of it as like a phased uh, clinical trial. And hopefully at the end, we get a, we get a product out of that. Um, and so those three areas, three therapeutic areas, like today, um, since 
I call crop protection medicinal chemistry for plants. Um, you can you can see these three areas here: weed control, disease management, mostly fungi, um, and then insect management um, for various insects around the world. And so I've just shown here three structures. Um, first one here is rinse core. It's a rinse core herbicide. It has a, it won us a green chemistry award in 2018. I'll talk a little bit that, about that a little later. Um, Adavelt, one of our newest, um, soon to be launched uh, fungicides, uh, natural product inspired there. And lastly, uh, Spinosad, uh, which is our natural product insecticide we hear uh, at Corteva, which also won us a, 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 a sorry, 1999 green chemistry award. And so you might be thinking agrochemistry, this is pretty easy. You get to test on the organism. Uh, why is it so difficult to get a, get a product out of, uh, of a small molecule product out? And so you, um, you might be familiar with ADME and if you're in the pharmaceutical realm, uh, absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism, excretion. In this case, in the agrochemistry world, it's degradation. And very similarly, we have to follow these properties to get a product. However, there's other, there's other challenges in the agrochemistry world. And so let's say you have a plant, let's say you have some sun or ho hopefully sun and not rain, um, and you spray your compound on your plant. And you get this little nice little water droplets all over your ground on the plant. And you think, well, it's in the plant now, it's gonna control the weed. If it's gonna, if it's gonna go to the target site, it's gonna go there and you're done. However, there's many, many challenges. Just because you spray a plant does not mean that your molecule actually reach a target site. You can't force inject uh, every single plant with your active ingredient. And so there's challenges like leaf structure, flow mobility, plant metabolism, and root uptake. And those are just the ones from the plant. There's also environmental uh, challenges, right? There's, there's uh, volatility, there's UV stability, wash off, water leaching, soil metabolism, and so on. And so all of these uh, do uh, uh, give us a challenge in the agrochemistry industry. On top of that, if you if you've been um, if you look at the spray nozzles and formulation, you, you now you look at issues of droplet size. Um, you look at water solubility and making sure the compound still stays in the solution or in the formulation. And all of these are another challenge for us in the in the um, agrochemistry industry. And again, all of these also uh, um, also uh, affect the sustainability of the product. And so there's many variables before and after spraying of the compound. There's uh, different uh, properties associated with different research areas. And so those research areas I'm talking about are the fungicide, weed man fungicide, herbicide versus insecticide. Each one of these areas has a different property they need to actually get it into the plant or on the soil. And so depending on the actual product, you would have different properties associated with those things. And so again, uh, you have to have tune those properties uh, for fit, the, fit the need. And so how do we actually now design a sustainable active ingredient? And so Peter set this up pretty well. He said that before we were in a linear scale, we were looking for potency, 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 and field translation. And then we went after um, the regulatory or the sustainability portion. I'm calling sustainability the whole package. And so in this case, uh, the potency needs to be balanced with that environmental effect. And so these things like aquatic tox, mammalian tox, beneficial insects, we're looking at soil degradation, water ground leaching. All of these are part of a environmental or a regulatory package that we have to go through and we have to make sure that we uh, check all these boxes. And so some of the tools we use to, to evaluate um, these assays or these um, criteria, uh, we do a lot of high throughput early screening. And so this is probably in the last decade where, high, where automation and high throughput has come alive, where now we can do high throughput assays um, for different aquatic tox uh, testing or mammalian tox testing. We do a significant amount of mode of action determination. And this is really due to, we don't want to send a, we don't want a product that has a mode of action that is not sustainable or that is uh, detrimental to uh, um, animals or in the environment. And so if there is already resistance in the market, we don't want to put another, another molecule out there that already has resistance. That's a waste of the farmer's time. That's a waste of our time. And so that is important to us to making sure that we actually are advocating for our farmers um, and are also consumers. And this leads me to our next one, uh, biochemical assay, uh, assays for resistance types. And so there's different types of resistance out there. There could be met metabolic resistance, 
it could be site uh, resistance. And that differential is, is very important to understand. And so um, Peter mentioned the azoles out that, uh, earlier. There's a number, there's a number of resistance in the azole series, but if you can find a differentiation in that azoles, that's very important um, to showcase and you get a different class of uh, mode of action. Um, and so the last two here, I think there, uh, one is, has been around for a number of years uh, in silico models. We've, uh, you know, anyone from pharmaceuticals to ag chemistry, everyone uses in silico models um, and, and computational chemistry to push forward and how do we uh, find a sustainable and potent uh, product. However, I wanna just briefly mention here machine learning. And this is an up and coming area in, in the area of uh, pharmaceuticals, but also agrochemistry, where can we find new chemical space that is sustainable in terms of a discovery, but also process chemistry and, uh, and formulations also. And so at Corteva, uh, we have been uh, tasked with this challenge for many years now. And we have uh, six green chemistry awards over the past a uh, little over two decades now. Um, that is more green chemistry awards than all the agro industry combined. Um, and so some of you might be familiar with these green chemistry awards from the pharmaceutical industry um, like Merck. Um, and you might be thinking, well, those are green chemistry uh, pathways or synthetic pathways that are really efficient. So those are not, those are, for those of you who are not aware, there's actually an, um, a sub categories in the green chemistry award. Um, and those are the green pathways I mentioned. There's also a designer, uh, design of greener reaction conditions award. And there's also a design of greener chemicals award. And so five out of six of, the, our, of our awards are actually on the design of greener chemicals award. And so we at Corteva have uh, put a stake in the ground saying we do not want to um, commercialize products that are not sustainable. And so uh, this is just a, 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 a um, this is a, 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 a tribute to what we've done in the past and we want to continue that um, um, trend or tradition we've done at Corteva. And you can see here, we have two products here as shown here that also have one can chemistry awards, but also one of our newest products that just launched this year, Enatrek, it's a natural product-based uh, fungicide. And we are one of the leaders in the agrochemistry industry for natural products. We have a whole natural product team dedicated to exploring new natural products, um, discovering new natural products. And we believe this is a fundamental um, uh, pillar for the sustainability of agrochemistry. And so just one quick example of what I mentioned about machine learning and, and natural products. Um, Back in 1999, uh, we released uh, Spinosat, or we won the Green Chemistry Award for Spinosat, I should say. Um, and we've done, we did an extensive amount of SCR research in this area, and we found this compound here, 5,6-dihydroespinosin A. And it really it gave us an improved photostability and, and residual control to make sure the product is, is, is um, sustainable. However, when we actually took uh, that same molecule and went, went through an uh, artificial neural net, we actually discovered a new molecule here, uh, this uh, ethoxy, um, three ethoxy spinosa J. And so our chemist and scientists at Corteva at the time, or Dow at the time, I should say, uh, combined these two, um, these two attributes and they were able to develop a new product called Spinaram, um, which actually has a dihydro 5,6 uh, olefin and also an ethyl group here. And this now is a new product, which also won a green chemistry award for a greener insecticide. And so this is just one example of how we combined machine learning, how we combine natural products and to really push forward in the future of, of agrochemistry. And so I just wanna uh, finish this section uh, by saying that there's still ongoing challenges in this area. It's not all solved um, just because we're in looking into drones and, and looking into um, uh, machine learning and silicon models and high throughput and automation, it doesn't mean everything's solved. And so this is just a call out to the general community and saying there's still a dearth, uh, a dearth of uh, protein crystal structures related to plants, fungi, and insects out there. Um, you can imagine a lot of the protein um, data banks out there are all a lot of proteins about human, pro uh, human enzymes and human proteins. And so these are, we do use these as homology models, but um, there is a lack of information, biochemical information out there on plants and fungi and insects. And so this is related now to the uh, limited funding for academic research out there. I think this is something that needs to improve in the overall industry um, and, and the community in the science community that uh, a lot of times we fund a lot of our larger 
anti-cancer and anti-microbial um, uh, studies, but we don't fund our, our food supply and we don't fund our food research. Um, and lastly here, just I'll mention the, the basic research for organic chemistry and chemical biology. And so as a natural product uh, chemist uh, in grad school, um, I would have to say that, you know, I, I will, uh, that when you see all these natural products out there and there's always, this is anti-cancer, this is antimicrobial, you rarely see natural products that have been isolated and tested on, on uh, agrochemical uh, um, species that are chemical important species or fungi. And so this is just a call out to the community and saying, you know, there's more out there than just screening your natural products and your small molecules against the um, pharmaceutical world. You can also screen them against uh, agrochemical um, areas. And so with that, I'll shift gears a little bit to um, a different type of sustainability and that's uh, process chemistry. And so sustainability with a manufacturing uh, process in mind. And so, um, as many of uh, you might know on the call here that uh, the production volumes of agrochemical are large. And so there are you know, over 10,000 metric tons for most of these uh, agrochemicals and that's because they're used all around the world. And so because of that, we have to be sustainable in how we produce these agrochemicals. And so um, shown on the right here, uh, we see the, the ideal synthetic process map here. We see low cost, safe, sustainable, simple, robust supply chain and patent protected. And all of these put together are important into making sure that that um, AI, it actually can be produced sustainability, sustainable. Um, and so we use tools like uh, high throughput uh, experimentation and, and the design of experiments. Um, and those tools really get us uh, to check off some of these boxes of exploring different routes and being cost effective. And so um, I just want to mention a lot of these uh, starting materials need to be also available on 100 metric tons. And there's not many things around the world that are available on 100 metric tons that you can use uh, to, to develop a small molecule. And so um, that's something that we uh, in the industry look at every day um, to find new ways of accessing large amounts of material, but in a safe manner. And so uh, um, it's not all about always the cost of uh, cost of manufacturing because that's not what the farmer cares about. Farmers have a budget um, and it's usually by hectare. And so a hectare is a, basically one hectare is a baseball field for those who don't know, or for those of, in, in, those of you in Europe, it's about a, about a rugby field. And so um, if you're talking about a molecule to spray on corn or soy, that, mo that molecule uh, you know, needs to be sold for somewhere between five and $10 a hectare. And so if you think about that um, and you extrapolate from this graph here, you're looking at something that's very dirt cheap. You have to you know, synthesize a molecule that's very, that's very cheap and very, um, very efficacious. And so we can't charge the farmer an arm and a leg to spray their field or to buy a compound to spray their field. And this is, this is actually, uh, it goes back to the cost of manufacturing. And so um, a quick example here uh, from Corteva, uh, one of our recent molecules, Adivelt, as I mentioned before, um, it's synthesized, uh, our newest route we have for process development is synthesized from uh, these three starting materials here, uh, which account for about 41% of the carbon count in this entire molecule. And so we can buy uh, the pure for our raw material for, for a dollar a kilo. Um, and it's a renewable feedstock, which makes this even, uh, this makes this, makes this a very good sustainable uh, a route for this molecule. So one of the key steps in this route um, is this, uh, is this uh, reduction here. We have this diol and the first generation route we had was this TFA uh, triethylsilane DM, DCM route here to get us this chiral alcohol. However, realize that you know, uh, triethylsilane is not cheap. It is not renewable, it's not sustainable. And so uh, we were able to do a number of, of high throughput screens here and we're able to actually find this uh, PMHS uh, reagent that actually is a um, byproduct of the silicone industry um, and delivers a hydride to displace, uh, sorry, to uh, reduce the second alcohol from this molecule and keeping the ER the same. And so this is just one example of things we're doing at Corteva and how we want to make sure that our routes are, are, um, are sustainable um, and we are you, you know, using high throughput and screening and automation to get this done. 
And so the other part about part of, of uh, pro, uh, process, product and pro, process and product development is the formulations. And so this is something that people don't really talk about often, but uh, the AI is one thing in the, in the package. The, the formulation is the other half of the, pa more than half the package uh, a lot of times. And so formulations uh, need to be success, it needs to be sustainable. And so things um, at Corteva, we've developed uh, low drift technology that makes uh, our, our products uh, stick to the plant and not, not drift in around uh, during spring. Um, we also make sure that all of our co-formulants are safe and healthy, uh, safe and, and risk-free um, around uh, people. And so this is something we, we look for um, in, in all of our co-formulants. And so um, also we look for farmer convenience and local, local focus. So a farmer from Brazil has a different way of, of spraying soybeans than a farmer from Iowa. And so we need to make sure that our formulations are actually fitting what they want. And so it could, could it be a, a, um, uh, a granular uh, formulation versus a liquid formulation? What does that look like? Do they want to pre-mix? Do they not want to pre-mix? Things like that also um, matter for sustainability in terms of packaging. And so all of these put together uh, really are important to our formulation group. And they, they, they strived to make sure whatever product they actually put on the market is farmer focused. And so um, there again, still is ongoing challenges in the area of process and product development. Um, I mentioned, you know, we've had some successes with, you know, uh, uh, low cost uh, catalytic reactions. Uh, but there's still, if you look at the ac academic literature or even industri industrial literature, there's uh, a large amount of these fancy catalysts, fancy ligands out there. And there's no way that in an agrochemistry performance, agrochemistry process, uh, process chemistry lab, can these be amenable. And so, you know, again, a call out to the academic community maybe, or the industry. Um, it's really, can we, look, can we look for green, low cost catalytic reactions? Um, also mentioned here, the chiral reactions. There's a push for chiral um, AI is coming from discovery. And so can we actually produce these in a low cost manner? You know, we have amino acids and other uh, chiral pool molecules you can use, but those are only, can only last for so long um, and give us for only so many compounds. And so is there other ways we can find, uh, other ways we can make chiral agrochemical products? And lastly, talking about formulations, um, there's a limited amount of uh, formulation science education and research in the, in, in the academic setting. Um, to my knowledge, there's no uh, PhD uh, in formulation science, really. And so there's kind of a lot, a lot of on-the-job training that needs to be done. And so this is something that um, I didn't appreciate until I started, you know, hanging around more uh, 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 formulation scientists. And so that's something that uh, would be an interesting area uh, to tackle from the science community. And so with that, um, I hope I, uh, I've told you a little bit about the discovery and process and product development uh, area of sustainability. Uh, I apologize, I can't, I wouldn't, was not able to talk about application technology and product stewardship, hopefully another time. Um, but there's one thing that drives all of this change and it's the people. Um, and people really drive uh, uh, all of these sustainability changes. And that's really um, talking about the next generation of farmers, conscious consumers, these fruitful collaborations in science and also diversity of scientists, farmers and consumers. And so what I'm talking about is really uh, the farmers adopting new technologies. If they don't adopt, adopt new technologies, then there's no, there's no need for us to develop those things. Um, and then the consumers are requesting sustainably grown food nowadays. And so we need to adapt to what they want, the consumer wants. And lastly, I think um, this picture shows, the picture speaks a thousand words here. Diversity is the pillar of sustainability, whether it be in the lab, whether it be um, on the farm. Farming is a, a global, a global uh, uh, um, tradition. And so we need our, our scientists needs to, our scientists need to uh, resemble the customers we're actually affecting. And so um, I'll just mention lastly here, collaborations do lead to success. And so these are just some of the collaborations that we have done in the past um, at Corteva. And so these span from motive action all the way to machine learning and regulatory and so on. Um, and that has been a real a pillar for us to succeed. And so I'll finish with um, sustainability is a, is a whole system approach. It's not just the AI, it's not just the manufacturing, it's not just the application, it's all of it put together. You know, machine learning and, and, and automation is, is coming a long way. It's helping us succeed in many of these areas. 
natural products has been a huge, huge uh, effort for us in, in Corteva, and, and we, we see it as the future, one of the future uh, pillars of, of um, sustainability. And lastly, manufacturing formulations um, and green chemistry are key, key attributes of these of a sustainability simple product. Well, thank you very much. We're running a little bit over, so let's. Sure. Why don't we have a lot of questions queued up. Why don't we go ahead and get started? But I, I will start with with one for you. Uh, you were the first person to mention green chemistry, though you didn't specifically hone in on the green chemistry principles. Uh, how important are the green chemistry principles in the thought process and in going into designing new new agrochemicals? So is your question, I guess, talking about the green chemistry principles of manufacturing or are you talking about green chemistry principles of? Uh, I was talking mainly, I think about the, you know, the Anastas and Warner green chemistry, 12 principles of green chemistry kind of look. Yeah, so I think it's very important for us uh, to design our molecules uh, to fit, the, fit those green chemistry principles. Um, I know our, green, our process chemistry group is looking at green solvents, looking at lowering um, transition metal transition metal amounts and things like that. And so I think it's very important for the sustainable um, uh, future of the products. So, okay. so uh, George kind of lit up people by, I think, two things. He showed the, uh, the precipitous drop off in 1990 of no new actives for herbicides. So one, one question is, is that true of pesticides and fungicides as well? And do you have a reason for that? You, you spoke of a finite resource. Did we run out or are there still modes of action? Um, um, I'd recommend you read some things by Stephen Duke, who's written about this, but uh, some quick answers are that um, one was that glyphosate was so effective and so dominant that the returns to developing something new for a certain period of time were, you know, were not uh, that great. So it looked like, you know, you know, this is just taking over, you know, it's, it's replacing things that we already had. So the expected returns to developing things new, um, you know, went down. That's one explanation. Um, another explanation is that we've had a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and there's a debate in economics to what extent that you know, spurs innovation or decreases it, but that's another change, whether that's causative or not, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I think the other two speakers also highlighted another difference, right? There's this Venn diagram of all these targets you now have to hit, right? In 1950, 1960 is... Does this kill weeds? Does this kill insects? Now there's all these extra environmental uh, considerations uh, that have to, to, to go into the whole R&D uh, endeavor. So I think it's a combination of factors, but, but um, you know, the, the, the hurdles in terms of the attributes of the compounds is difficult. And we've made a lot of discoveries. So I think it's a combination of, you know, more hurdles to go through, um, easier th things were found already, um, and that for a long time glyphosate dominated the market so much that it it kind of put other companies off in, in terms of looking. Okay, so if I see okay. Peter just uh, Peter yeah, just, just unmuted himself. I just wanted to add a little bit um, um, and build uh, on George's uh, comment. You know, the way I look at it, um, uh, first of all totally new mode of action is challenging. I think this is challenging in pharma, this is challenging in our industry, but actually I see that there are within mode of actions quite, let's say, variations. So I would say we have to take a little bit more differentiated picture today because we have in classes like azoles, turbulurins, we have new classes arising that actually overcome of some of these challenges. So I would say actually I'm a little bit more positive here. I see that there is innovation coming and really um, um, ways of supporting farmers in overcoming um, um, these hurdles. So a little bit more optimistic here. So I'll, I'll direct this next question to you, Peter. Uh, someone asked, isn't biotech supposed to solve all the need for agrochemicals? Uh, <laughs> um, um, as indicated in my talk, um, I think more options actually um, are benefiting um, farmers. So it's not either or, it's really end. Yeah, so I, I really feel very strongly that um, the toolbox today, it's richer. 
and we have to use all the tools um, chemistry we have to use the tools that come from biotech and we have the to take the tools that come from digitalization are emerging so in that aspect i would say the world is um, is getting richer and i think this is also for me the way how we can help pharma to really um, find the balance and um, do sustainable farming uh, Tejas, I'll direct this next one to you. you, you uh, you're also muted. You took a, a very um, chemistry-oriented thing, but I happen to know, and since we were, used to be colleagues, that uh, spinosad or spinosaram was actually found from biology and is still synthesized via fermentation. So wh when do you make the call as to how to make something, whether it be bio or, or chemistry? So um, spinosaram and spinosad are both, yeah, fermented. Um, so is the one molecule showed uh, in a trek that's also fermented. And then there's one last step, um, synthetic step. And so it's gonna be a cost uh, manufacturing question. Can we synthesize it on scale for the same cost that we would, man that we would ferment it? And so it's, it's just a, um, a cost manufacturing uh, difference there. And so we have a great team of scientists that um, are experts in fermentation and um, genetic engineering for uh, fungi. And so we've done a great job of actually being able to produce these large quantities of natural products, these complex natural products on scale. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure who to direct this to. So whoever chooses to raise their hand first. Um, the, uh, it was, the actual question was, it was surprising to learn how little innovation is taking place in the development of new modes of herbicides. What about adjuvants? Any promising developments here. So someone define adjuvants first for the rest of the of us and then talk about the developments, whoever wants to jump on that one. Anyone? Go ahead, Peter. Are you <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, I think so adjuvants are, um, um, I say the soap that helped to uh, penetrate the plant. It's a little bit uh, uh, maybe the, the simplistic way of looking at it. Um, yeah, I think formulation and, and, and I think it was uh, pointed out earlier, is really important um, um, to make a crop protection product um, 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 really effective. And then I think we have also talked about additional elements, um, smart sprayers, um, drones of application. So again, um, here, new options coming in that actually enriches, I think, um, will in the future offer farmers ways of doing and managing um, their land in a sustainable fashion. Okay. Again, a question, I don't know who wants to jump on this one, but the, the question is that a lot of focus is on the big field crops, and yet there are many more things from a food perspective that we all care about. We want fruits and vegetables as well. Is the model that we have today serving all of the markets that are needed, or is there too much focus just on the field crops? Um, I mean, that's, that's, this has been a classic problem. It's kind of like the orphan drug problem, right? You have some, certain pharmaceuticals that are treating very, very rare diseases. And, you know, you know, there isn't necessarily a market for those. So, um, you know, there, you know, there are a lot of crops, especially crops in Africa, roots and tubers, where they just don't have like the market sales that the big field crops do. Um, and I think this is a classic case of where public research um, is really important because you know, private, just the private sector may not have a profit motive or a pop profit advantage in doing that, but, but it, it, it suggests that you know, public plant breeding uh, remain in you know, public uh, R&D and those kinds of things is still important. So, so let's spin this on the on the public R and D. There were a couple mm. of things mentioned. A couple of times, uh, mentions were made of needing more research in certain areas. If you were in charge, if any of you were in charge of the world, how would you make the situation better than it is today with respect to finding new materials, uh, speeding up the the pace of getting them into the market? Um, any of the things that that research could do. Yeah. Maybe I take a first uh, a first uh, step to this. Uh, it's very very. I think it's a challenging question that you're putting out here, Mark. Um, from my perspective, um, when I look uh, at the um, development of agrochemistry as we have it, yeah, um, I would say clearly um, having clear um, and a predictable science-based regulatory framework is very important because I think as um, soon as you have clear 
um, let's say, clear targets, um, and then you have a clear market definition, I would say then you can adjust also um, um, your R&D. And I think this is also, this is um, the way I think it should be. And for, for in, the, in that respect, I think this framework is very important that it's uh, solid and science-based. I think for industry, um, I think we fully recognize that regulation is good. It's not our enemy, it's our friend, I would say. It also drives innovation, but I think it needs to be science-based and predictable. Anyone else want to weigh in? I would say like, for, oh, well, here, I'll jump in. For, for things like resistance management, sometimes it's, it's not products, it's, it's practices like crop rotations, things like that. And again, I think um, there, there's, there's a lot of innovation that isn't necessarily patentable inventions. And so, you know, the, the, you know having, you know, adequate support for, you know, public, you know, the public sector to be doing those kinds of things is, is crucial. And I think that, that complements what, what the private sector is doing, you know, and again, just, you know, more investment in basic science education is, is going to help. I'll just add that, you know, a lot of times, you know, if, if you're a chemist or a biologist uh, going through um, graduate school, you, you might apply for an uh, NIH or NSF, and there's a lot of funding out there for those kind of programs, um, but there's not not much, very much application for the agrochemistry or agro mm. uh, world. And so I think there's a, a, a funding difference from a academic sense for the agro industry uh, as a whole. And so if that changes, that could be a huge game changer for the industry, um, for the farmers, for food security, and so many things downstream. So uh, let's ask about, so we, we intrinsically in, in agrochemistry, you're making a molecule that you're going to put in the environment. So what are the tools that we are using and, do, and how do the tools need to be made better for predicting modes of action or predictive toxicology moving forward? Anyone who wants to answer that one? So I think I mentioned a little bit in my, in my slides, I think, with the rise of machine learning and AI and in silico models, particularly, um, we can do a lot more of predicting saying, hey, does that functional group gonna cause us issues in this regulatory test? Is this functional group gonna have issues in ecotox? And things, things like that, we can develop these really, ex really extensive models and machine learning algorithms that can help us um, distinguish early on if that molecule is even worth taking forward. And so, before we spend, spend millions and millions of dollars on you know, actual regulatory tests, we can do a lot of uh, in silico screening before that. Okay. Uh, building on Tejas, I think it's, this, is, um, this is really, I think, a, cha a game changer in this industry um, that we have, um, I think, this understanding of the molecular um, mechanism and that we have um, the, these early these early indicated tests, and I think um, I at least would observe that the number of failures actually um, in late stage development is minimal these days because you really can weed out most of this um, really in the early days. Yeah. So uh, I'll stick with you for a minute, Peter. Don't mute yourself too quickly. <laughs> um, th this is more of a question I think that comes kind of from an R and D management or. or uh, are we willing, what, what can we do as an industry to foster uh, better formulation science in, in academia, uh, better agrochemistry? Is there, is there something that we're not doing that we should be doing? Yeah, you know, I think personally that um, um, there are collaboration that I think um, every company has um, with basic science. I would honestly say that um, um, if people come with a very good degree understanding of um, 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 crop molecular biology, or they come with a very good understanding um, of organic synthesis, this is a very good starting point. And the rest you really learn as you do it. And I think this is also where I would say, I don't see that necessarily there's a change needed on the academic side per se. I would rather than agree with what George said is that it would be desirable clearly that also the topic of understanding of crops, a mechanism, um, that there's more, let's say, uh, resources for fundamental um, um, 
for fundamental research um, available. But honestly, I'm, I'm not so worried that on the education side, there is really a change needed. I see that the people, the people we get at BSF, greatly, you know, great scientists, and they all can, I think, learn the interdisciplinary play that is needed in, in the, uh, to develop these products. Not worried at all, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it's good to know you're relaxed, Peter. Um, uh, a, a topic that's come up in several of the questions concerns uh, collateral damage. Certainly we had the issues with bees lately. H how, how do we as a, as an industry or how, or as a field prevent those things from happening, the unintended consequences? Are we, are we really getting better at that or do we still have a ways to go? I would say yes and yes. I think we're, we're getting much better at it, uh, but there's a way to go. And, there's the irony of the more information you have, the more effects you're measuring. And so it could look like you're not, you're, you're gaining ground. But I think another thing we're seeing is that people are coming to agriculture from other aspects, like you know, from health aspects, from environmental aspects that don't necessarily have farming backgrounds, but they realize that, you know, that ag understanding agriculture is really important. But I think we've made a huge amount of progress in, in monitoring and understanding those ecological relationships. And again, with improvements um, in information technology and spatial things, we're just going to get better at it. But it may look like we're, we're not advancing as much because you have better monitoring systems, you're more likely to see problems when, when you were completely ignorant of them before. Uh, and I think a matter of fact is that actually there are no other chemicals on earth that are so well studied. What is their environmental behavior? Because we, you know, they are used in the environment than agrochemicals. So I think in that respect, I think they are the best studied chemical um, uh, products that are um, there on the planet. Yeah. So I, I guess I'll spin this kind of, you know, for this point in time, we were, we as the human race have been confronted by a pandemic. There's a potential for pandemic, things like rust, you know, fungi on wheat or something happening in, in the world. How quickly can we respond? Because it, it does seem as though the pace of bringing a new active to market is slow. Do, do we have a reserve that if we had to spin it up, we really could? Nobody wants to jump on that one. No, I think, <laughs> no, I think uh, Mark, uh, realistically, first of all, um, you always will try to address it with existing products or new formulation. These you can get in the market. Um, and yes, in, in special situation, you might get special use permits um, 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 also um, uh, in existence. And I think we have seen that um, you know, a decade ago. So with Asian soybean rust that really emerged very quickly. Um, and here, I think the industry did respond very well in um, bringing products uh, to the market to serve farmers to scope with these. And now, if you really have to start from scratch, it will take longer than developing, um, 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 a, a, a developing uh, you know, a, a vaccine. And I think we, every, everybody is waiting for the vaccine already. And I think it shows, I think your question, I think addresses that um, a continuous innovation is truly needed. Um, there is something, this is also people will only realize how important it is. Um, when you have outbreaks like Asian soybean rust or disease that really progress. And I think we try as an industry to watch and understand together with academic partners how certain pest disease and, and weeds are developing so that we direct our R&D resources as early as, early as possible um, also into these fields. Okay. I'm being reminded that we are up against our time. Uh, why don't we go in reverse order of our speakers? Any final comments, Tejas? Uh Thank you for the time, uh, and uh, it was, I think, um, sustainability is very important to Corteva and the industry itself. I think we have a long ways to go, um, but we're making a significant progress in the area. Okay, thank you. George? Yes, thank, thanks for the invitation. Kind of following on that last question, I think what COVID shows is, you know, the importance of having a lot of international coordination, and that's going to be important for plant diseases in the future. Okay. And Peter, you get the last word, my friend. Thank you very much. I think it's an exciting field. And I personally believe that uh, sustainable agrochemistry um, is a reality and something that I think 
the entire community is really striving for. So, you know, be positive. Okay. Uh, I am unclear whether I'm to turn it back to Ellen or whether just to say we're done. So, so Ellen, are we done? Hi, yes, uh, we're, we're done, but I just wanna remind the audience that we will have an exciting 2021 and that we have two workshops coming up in 2021, one on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and another on laboratory automation. And we will have uh, two additional webinars uh, during 2021. So stay tuned and thank you very much for attending. All right, thank you all. Okay.